So participatory mapping and counter mapping. Here's the plan. Uh, so we're going to start by going over what is participatory mapping and we're not going to discuss the reading. Um, and then I'm going to give a bit of background and then applications of participatory mapping, um, followed by methods of mapping, challenges of concern, and then counter mapping. So what is participatory mapping? It's basically a method of mapping where community members create maps based on their own insider knowledge of the area, because um, essentially locals will know any area better than any outsider would. Um, and there's a lot of different approaches to go about this, but we'll go through that later. So we're not going to discuss the reading by Leftison because I like this little image. Um, anyways, a bit of background. So, um, participatory mapping is basically a bottoms-up approach where the people create maps for everyone versus the top-down where the people with power are making the maps for the masses. Um, and although it's usually used in developed countries, it's helpful in urban areas and in cities, someone personally and closely familiar with a space will have a different perspective than say um, a city surveyor or a planner who's just coming in from the outside, not already knowing this space as well as everyone who's lived there for years. Um, so the goal would be to create a map with a greater level of knowledge than traditional maps, basically. So like no map created by some surveyor who comes into the city could reflect the amount of knowledge that a map could when it's been done by the residents. So that's the biggest difference here with participatory mapping is that it's the community that does the mapping. All right, applications of participatory mapping. To help communities communicate spatial knowledge to external agencies. So maps are a good way to present complex information in an easy to understand way, and it's good for groups with language barriers, or if people don't speak English or have a lot of literary knowledge, it's easy to commun communicate what they want to about their community to other people, like planners or people who are trying to do funding, that kind of thing. So next is to allow communities to archive and record local knowledge. Um, so an example of this would be like indig indigenous groups um, with like land ownership and rights and everything. Um, and so basically if someone's going to be coming in and developing a lot on land or taking away their land. This is really helpful for them to have a knowledge and a solid record of where their land is and everything. Um, and it just results in a clear record of local spatial knowledge. So not just with in indigenous people, but everyone is helpful to have that on record. Um, and then to help communities with land use and resource management. So this helps share community knowledge about land and resources with outsiders, which would in turn benefit the group and how their land is managed. And then to enable communities to advocate for change. Um, so this is where counter mapping kind of comes in and I'm going to talk about that more later. But um, it's like a tool for advocacy, it can be used for political action and it's, yeah to address resource related conflict, which would be like to avoid and reduce conflict between community and outsiders, um, and also like internal issues within a community too. Um, it can be used for like mapping boundaries or um, land rights and it can visualize conflict and help resolve that. And then there's also to help create a clear identity and vision for the community. Um, so when a community can come together and work towards this greater good, it's helpful. So some of the various methods of mapping is using scale maps and images, as well as hands-on mapping and GIS and GPS. A hands-on mapping, um, it's a map drawn from memory by the community. It's not usually consistent in scale or exact measurements because it's just a hand-drawn um, visualization, um, but it does show relative size and position of the important features. Um, it's great because it's usable for all people. If people can't read, they don't have access to technology, and community that 
just has different cultural practices. This is a great way for everyone to, you know, do what they need to do. The drawbacks is that it's difficult to digitalize. It's not cartographically accurate. So putting this drawn, hand-drawn map onto like GIS and try to create an, a, leg, a legitimate map just isn't feasible. So here's where I thought some additional visuals would be helpful. So here's one of a small town, and then this is a larger one of a village. And as you can see, there's a lot of detail here with a lot of the animals and the legends and crops and everything. So scale maps and images, it's scaled, basically a scaled map or image that's used um, and community members mark the important features. So it's already, it's starting with the initial map um that's all to scale and everything then people map on it and a lot of the mapping is based on physical features so like rivers and like lakes and everything and a benefit of this is that it's easy to later locate information with gps and it's still easy to use and map and is geographically accurate but it without the community members having to know the technology they're just basing it off of an image um the drawbacks is that accurate and up-to-date scale maps aren't often available in places in like developing countries um so that can be really difficult to get a hand of here's a bit of a closer look at using these scale maps to do this community mapping and so as you can see on this one there's things like high crime rate high unemployment low quality of living areas and it's all mapped directly on a pre-existing map of the city so then GIS and GPS. As GIS is becoming increasingly available, this is a much more viable option for a lot of places. Um, it's super pre precise and results are attractive and it's valuable for advocacy because of the professional results that come out of it. So if you're trying to submit something to a board um, or get something approved or anything like that, this is the best way to go about it because it's gonna look good for your community. Um, the drawback is that there's a steep learning curve to the technology, it's not readily available, and it's expensive for some places, so this wouldn't be great in a developing country. It just, it's not as easy for everyone to access. So just for more examples, this is a map of London, and all the red spots are bicycle accidents. And then another example is this, which was created by an environmental organization in Milwaukee to contest urban poverty. Um, so, I mean, obviously there's different techniques based on the community. So in a developing community, there's not going to be that education level necessarily, but there also might not be as much access to technology or internet or just resources in general. So that's where you'd want to do something more like a hands-on map or a scaled map where it's really easy for the community members to just like put what they know out versus in a more developed area, there's going to be a lot of infrastructure and a lot more will need to be mapped with a lot more people. And so that will where GIS or GPS would be easier. Also in a more urban area, it's there's a lot more information already available so there's already going to be maps and scaled images and everything for the people to use so it's going to be easier to like use the resources since it's already partially there here's a video that i just thought was helpful to add that gives kind of a sense of how this is actually used and so this is a community that mapped using gis and GPS data and basically this visually just shows going through each of the items that was mapped either campsites or food or water for drinking and all those kind of resources and so then this map would give an overview to the community members of where things are located relative to the village. Now I just sped this video up just so you don't have to watch the whole thing, but I want to have it here just to give a visual sense because I think it's really helpful for me to really understand how this was mapped. Now this is a relatively small scale 
map comparative to if this were to occur in a small village, which would be a larger scale map with more detail. But I still thought it was a great example. So there's a lot of challenges and concerns that also go along with participatory mapping. Um, so some mapping tools and technology favor people with access. So that's a, a case where, you know, in a developing country, they're not going to be able to use GPS and GIS technologies as much as like a more urban or developed country would be able to. It's important to avoid researcher subject relationships in participatory mapping. So what that basically means is the um, community members should be equal in contribution to the researchers, so there should be an even exchange of information, they should all be equal parts in the process, it shouldn't be like the researcher and the subject. Um, it's like an evil playing field, kind of. Um, participatory research must be beneficial to participants too, so this kind of goes along with that, where the participants are also stakeholders, and they should equally be involved in the back and forth and in the exchanges. It often requires a large data set to effectively show points on maps. So this is when you're using GIS or GPS information. It's hard to show a mass of many small points on a map without having a high resolution, specifically for urban areas where there's going to be like a lot of points. Um, so that can be tricky depending on availability of maps and resolution. Um, and then just GIS mapping can be difficult in general and it takes a lot of training so a lot of people will come in for participatory re um, mapping like researchers will come in and they'll offer the community members a course and they'll give them the whole rundown and like take them through the steps and teach them how to use this technology but that can take a long time it can be expensive and there just might not, might not be the access or funds or resources to do that so that's not always ideal um, so then counter mapping. Counter mapping is basically a subsection of participatory mapping and it's when the community or group takes a formal mapping into their own hands and uses it to bolster their message. It's typically politically charged or just some kind of like a group that is being marginalized or overlooked and they are using this as a way to display the inequality. It's usually used against government or anything political. So now I'm just going to go through some examples of counter mapping that was used. I have one up here that I don't actually show and it's the immigrants mapping their journey. There's this woman that I've read about who was coming up from Mexico into the United States um, and as she crossed the border she mapped everywhere that she stayed, the houses that took her in, where it was safe to go, where it wasn't safe to go, um, dangers, all that kind of stuff. And she made this comprehensive map to cross the border. And this could be shared with other people crossing, outsiders, anything just to show what she went through. Um, so then this is a map. I'm not sure what the city is, but it was... Um, the homeless were asked to share their experiences and stories on a map of their city. And as you can see, there's just areas they shouldn't go, places where people they know have died, or places that they can get food, or places they can sleep or can't sleep. Um, and this basically ends up creating this visual map that others can use, other homeless people can use, but also more just to educate the community. Um, to see like what's going on and see it from their perspective, which is like a perspective that typically you wouldn't be able to encounter. So that's one way to go about it. And this is a disorientation guide created by University of North Carolina. And it just, it shows um, things like dangerous pedestrian intersections, housing states or housing stats, um, neighboring schools, their information, research corporations, international students. And it just gives us overview of the school that you wouldn't find on like the school website but it's insider information that would be really helpful for students um and it's created by students for students and not affiliated with the school so that's basically in a sense what counter mapping is so yeah
That's it.